Well, let me welcome everyone to the 2021 SR Northern Distinguished Lecture Series uh, Lecture. Um, my name is Michelle Teo and I'm in the Executive Director. Before I hand over to our Chairman, Mr. Bilahari Kausikan, there are just a few house rules. We have turned off everyone's uh, microphones and cameras. Uh, there will be no raised hand function. During any of the Q&A sessions, please uh, route your questions through the Zoom chat yeah. and uh, the moderators will then feed the questions or ask the questions of both of our guests. So uh, there will be no there will be no live questioning. Uh, it will all go through the Zoom chat. We'll remind you again at the end of uh, each, uh, uh, just before we start the Q and A for each round. So, Chairman, um, I will hand the floor to you now. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, welcome, everybody, from uh, whichever country you happen to be in, and of course, uh, a special warm welcome and thanks to our speaker, His Excellency Omar Saif Gobash, I hope I pronounced that correctly, and our own very, our very own Minister for Home Affairs and Law in Singapore, Mr. K. Shamogam. I think all the Singaporeans in the audience will have no, uh, would have read the bios of these two gentlemen, so I won't uh, try to summarize their very rich careers. I will just say that Minister Shamogam has very kindly agreed to open today's lecture by a few words of his own. And after that, he will take a very few questions before letting uh, the main event begin, which is His Excellency Omar Saif Gobash. Uh, Minister Shamogam, over to you, please. Thank you, Bella. Uh, His Excellency Omar Saif Gobash. Assistant Minister for Cultural Affairs, United Arab Emirates. Uh, Bilahari is our chairman, Middle East Institute. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, very good afternoon to all of you. And, uh, you know, it's a privilege to be with all of you today for this Asad Nadan Distinguished Lecture organized by the MER. Our distinguished speaker today, His Excellency Omar Saif Gobash currently serves as the Assistant Minister for Cultural Affairs for the UAE. And previously, he was ambassador to France, as well as ambassador to, ambassador to Russia. His Excellency is also the author of a very interesting book. It's titled Letters to a Young Muslim. It's been very favorably received and reviewed. And it addresses some of the key questions uh, that many uh, young people, young Muslims ask. And it's a question of how Muslims can find a voice that is true to Islam while actively engaging in the modern world. So, and uh, I'm standing between you and his remarks. I have been asked to say a few things uh, it, to set the context as it were. My remarks will be relatively brief. Uh, and I, the areas I would cover, you know, I will touch on three areas, which I, looking at it from our perspective, quite important to us. One, the current developments in the Middle East, and two, the links between the Middle East and Southeast Asia, and three, the implications for the Southeast Asian region. Now, current developments in the Middle East, uh, you know, people who have been observing the region will, show, will notice that it's undergoing a key transformation in the economic, social, cultural, as well as geopolitical fields. On the economic front, countries in the Middle East are dealing with two major issues, oil prices as well as demographics. There's been a spike up in oil prices in recent days, but in general, the forecast for the price of oil is something like US $55 per barrel in 2023 and beyond. And that's below the fiscal break even price for many oil producing countries. And that can be a big challenge for some of the countries in the Gulf. Second on demographics. Countries in the Gulf Cooperation Council have one of the fastest growing, youngest populations anywhere in the world. But however, many of those young people are also facing difficulty in finding employment. So when you have a combination you know, of young population, large numbers of young people, and high youth unemployment, that brings a set of unique challenges and will have to be managed very carefully. So the questions are, and there are many, how will the countries transform their economies to reduce their dependency on oil and gas 
and also deal with the rising, rising expectations of a young population. Then if you turn to the sociocultural sector, changes are also being made in, at that level. So the UAE, for example, has announced some significant moves in the context of how Islam has been practiced in the Middle East and in many other places in the world. For example, just one vignette. Last year, the UAE announced a law to allow unmarried couples uh, to cohabitate. And uh, it also loosened uh, alcohol restrictions. It'll be both important uh, and interesting to see how these changes interplay with the various other dynamics in their respective societies. Other dynamics, including the practice of uh, Islam in some sections of the society, the uh, clerics, various factors. At the same time, you know, it seems likely that religion will continue to play a major role in the region. Uh, Arab Youth Survey last year, 2020, shows that 40% of young Arabs regard religion as the most important aspect of their personal identity, ahead of family, ahead of nationality, and ahead of gender. Others in the region, including Iran and Turkey, are also likely to rely on religion in reinforcing their own legitimacy. And if you turn to the geopolitical Middle East countries have traditionally depended on the United States for defense related issues, but they're also deepening the economic links with China. So in addition to managing regional tensions and the ambitions of different regional actors, Middle East countries will now also have to navigate the US-China relationship carefully. Uh, the second point I wanted to make, in Southeast Asia, we are watching these developments in the Middle East very closely. Southeast Asia has deep economic ties with the Middle East region. And for Singapore, bilateral trade with the Middle East countries was nearly $60 billion in 2019 and growing at a compound annual growth rate of 4.2% over the last five years. Across the region, it's a positive picture of strong growth in trade and economic links. But the role of the Middle East and its impact on Southeast Asia goes beyond trade and economic links. Both regions are linked uh, on the track of common religious identities and consciousness. Southeast Asia is home to close to 300 million practicing Muslims. Many Muslims across the world see the Middle East as a seat of Islam and a point of reference on religious matters. So the cultural and religious interactions between the Middle East and Southeast Asia are extensive and goes back centuries. But these close links also mean what happens in the Middle East can have a powerful effect and impact in this region. For example, the conflicts in the Middle East has led to some people in this region to make their way to the Middle East and join extremist groups. They receive training and are further radicalized and pose a threat to regional security in this region when they return back to Southeast Asia. In this context, uh, His Excellency's book, Letters to a Young Muslim, is especially instructive. His Excellency wrote the book for his then teenage sons to help them navigate the complexities of the modern world and insulate them from the draws of radicalism. From the book, I want my son's generation of Muslims to realize that they have the right to think and decide what is right and what is wrong, what is Islamic and what is peripheral to the faith. The book's core message to keep an open and critical mind to meet the challenges of the 21st century is extremely important and encouraging to us and something which I hope people in the re this region, both Muslims and non-Muslims will understand. As the Middle East continues to deal with the challenges, uh, the changes they are making, one key question is, is the direction in which Islam in Southeast Asia will move. Should there be tension in the Middle East that can also influence this region? So there are many questions, fewer certainties, and a very dynamic situation. In conclusion, we can ask many questions, and these are the questions that we have the opportunity to engage in in this SR Northern Distinguished Lecture Series. I hope all of you will have a rewarding experience and look forward uh, to the speech by His Excellency. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, to the audience,
as I mentioned, Minister Shamugan has kindly agreed to take a few questions. Uh, I want to keep it tight because we want, don't want to keep uh, His Excellency uh, uh, Omar Saif Gosh, Gobash waiting too long. But uh, please ask your questions and I'll uh, uh, succinctly and make sure they are questions and not speeches disguised as questions. Right? Uh, I'll ask the first one. Minister, you made reference to our, our guest's uh, excellent book. And that book, of course, focuses on uh, issues facing Muslims in particular. However, when I read the book, it occurred to me that its broader message has a wider relevance to all faiths, especially in uh, age as we live in, where you know identities of all kinds are being very insistently asserted, one more authentic than the other and so on. Would you agree with that? And if you do agree, or even if you don't agree, could you tell us why and how is this relevant in the Singapore context? Uh, I think it's particularly relevant to us. First of all, I agree with the uh, points that His Excellency makes, which you have uh, put out. You know, this is an era of uh, atomization of identity. Each one has, uh, we are going into smaller and smaller identities helped by the uh, online and the net. In that context, in this region, as well as in many other re regions, but particularly in this region, people are still very religious. It's not, uh, you know, the Christianity is very strong in Singapore. Islam, in fact, I think over 80% of our population, uh, people say that they uh, practice some faith and they are religious. If you look at that, I think how the, really, the faith can interact with modernity. How do you um, be both uh, uh, deal with the modern world and yet keep your faith? These are fundamental questions. And uh, you don't often get uh, very illuminating answers. So my view is this is a book that people of many different faiths can um, take a good deal away from in to help answer some of the questions that inevitably arise as uh, our identities get questioned. Thank you, Minister. We have got one more question. Um, it refers to your, your opening remarks and my, uh, my first question. And the question is as follows. We have seen in recent years the emergence of far-right evangelical Christian movements that take his cue from the United States, with two particularly warning instances occurring this year, a plot to attack two mosques here and a group promoting the use of uh, ivermectin to treat COVID. Since 9-11, we have involved the Muslim community to tackle Islamic extremism. Is the same model or the same playbook still applicable in this day and age to other faiths? You know, I have repeatedly said that it is uh, wrong to couple the idea of radicalization and extremism to any particular religion. I've made that point repeatedly. You just look at this region. You have uh, countries where Buddhists are attacking uh, Muslims and you have uh, Muslims attacking non-Muslims. You have uh, instances of Christians attacking Muslims. Uh, you have situations of Hindus attacking Muslims too, and vice versa. So uh, to try and say this religion, radicalism, I think is, um, uh, is both inaccurate and, and uh, we fall into an error that, uh, you know, many people, some people make, particularly in the media. So we, we need to get away from that. We need to recognize that in every religion, there are people who will misuse it, abuse it, and use it to attack uh, people of other faiths, sometimes for political reasons, sometimes for other reasons, but it's usually got a nexus, which has got very little to do with faith and uh, religion. The model that we use 
depends on the religion and depends on the extent of the issue if you speak specifically to singapore the um, so far the uh, number of uh, instances where the, either there has been a far right uh, uh, sort of uh, you know planned attacks or christians seeking to attack any other uh, places of worship we have picked up one case one boy and he is being we have taken a leaf out of the model we used for the extremist from the muslim faith that we picked up after 911 we used uh, the local clerics because they have credibility government doesn't have credibility we go and tell people what the religion is about the, the ground up people came forward clerics they went to talk to the people who had been radicalized what islam is really about and many of them have become de-radicalized after a period of retention and after a period of receiving instructions on islam likewise we have uh, pastors working with this young man that we picked up so we we sort of took a leap from there but uh, so far it's one case thank you i think we have time for one more question for mr shamugam uh and then we'll move over to our guests uh well there are several questions for you minister but i'll choose um one that you can probably answer Excellent as quickly as possible uh is the decision to allow muslim women to wear the tudong as part of their uniforms nurses i believe made as a precautionary measure or is that merely a recognition of the times we are in where people are quicker to assert their identity as you have pointed out <laughs> i don't think uh, that the same move on uh, tudong for nurses has got something specific to with what i was talking about people asserting their identity i wouldn't consider the muslim women's desire to wear the tudong as falling within the category of assertion of identity that you and i referred to a bit earlier you know there is a legitimate uh, request a uh, sense of religiosity people feel women feel that they would like to wear the tudong and uh, in large areas um, in singapore there are no restrictions whether in government or in the private sector in some areas where a uniform is required there have been some restrictions but where it is possible to make a move we make a move bearing in mind that uh, if uh, an exception is made for one religion then others can make similar requests so we have said uh, uniform groups and uh, police and army and so on uh, it's difficult to make an exception but nursing uh, after a great deal of consideration discussion with the community discussion with the religious leaders uh, the view was that uh, the move can be made i would put it that way thank you minister uh and now we move to our special guest who has been waiting very patiently and i apologize for keeping waiting excellency oh, the floor is yours sir very right. well thank you uh, thank you very much um and uh, I, to, to be honest uh, i'm really humbled that um you know uh, you found all of well uh, you found so much uh, in my book that was of value so i'm i'm really very very touched i also have to be honest wherever i go in the world i go to the bookshop and i loiter near the religion section to to check if the book is still there yeah <laughs> so there, there was a copy i was in la uh, recently and there was a copy and so i i very humbly took it out and took a selfie so yeah. um so it means a lot to me yeah. um so i shall start so uh, first i'd like to thank you all uh, for having given me this opportunity to speak about the united arab emirates uh, in such a prestigious uh, forum i've been working in our foreign ministry on and off since the age of 22 this means that i've had the pleasure of seeing our foreign policy changing in significant ways from the early 1990s it's also given me time to think about what we were trying to achieve in previous iterations of policy and what we are aiming to achieve with the newest changes in our foreign policy um i also you know plan to be quite brief in in my comments in anticipation of your questions so it's tempting to look back at uh, two events in particular 
um, the events of 9-11, as well as the so-called Arab Spring, as kinds of starting points, even though they're 10 years apart, starting points for a foreign policy discussion. Um, but in fact, I think you should know where we were even further back to the early 1990s when I first stepped into the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, uh, unfortunately, at that time, I was uh, young, idealistic, impatient, and naive. Now, almost 30 years later, I like to think of myself as mature, wise, reasonable, if not jaded, and of course, still young. So at the time, um, it was uh, just after the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, uh, and there was definitely a change in Gulf Arab understanding of the relationship between the monarchies and the republics of the Arab world. The sense of cautious trust gave way to outright shock at the stand that the Republicans of the Arab world took against Kuwait and by implication against the uh, rest of the Gulf states. If this understanding didn't translate immediately into a change of foreign policy, then it simmered under the surface and is probably one of the key factors uh, that informs today's Gulf views of the rest of the Arab world. The realization that certain Arab populations celebrated the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait underlined for us that perhaps Arab solidarity wasn't as straightforward as making public statements at the Arab League. So I see this as one of the early triggers for a greater sense of self-interest, agency, and sovereignty. Whereas we would traditionally define ourselves as parties to the Palestinian, the Arab, and the Muslim causes, we now begin, began to think a little more vocally in opposition to what these affinities seem to demand of us in terms of national sacrifice. People and policymakers began to think in terms of what was good for us at home within our national boundaries. Then the terrible events of September 11th took place and suddenly we were thrown back into the Arab Muslim cauldron. All Arabs looked like the guilty party. Western states began to demand changes in educational and financial systems of the region in order to put a stop to the possibility of terrorist financing as well as extremist indoctrination. Tremendous pressure was put on Arab states to reform their systems. We began to wonder whether the problem was the problem of an image, the image of the Arabs and Islam, or whether there was a deeper set of real problems that existed beyond or beneath the issue of image. In the Emirates, we began to take steps to align ourselves with the kinds of values we believe represented us best. And quietly, we joined the Allied military action in Afghanistan. Initially, we did not want to trumpet our involvement, but we wanted to make clear that we stood against extremism, whether Islamic or other, whether Arab or other and that we would take concrete, tangible, and in this case, expensive steps to demonstrate this position. Alongside this involvement, our prime minister, the, ru the ruler of Dubai, made a remarkably prescient statement in the later 2000s, uh, when he said that Arab leaders must think carefully about how their youthful population's aspirations would be satisfied. And then he set to work with the other leaders of the UAE, uh, developing a robust and agile government sector to serve local and foreign residents and investors. Many of you will know about the various projects the UAE has launched from transformative real estate laws and projects to digitization and streamlining of government services, the expansion of ports, airports and airlines, as well as the establishment of financial centers that aim to service the globe rather than just a regional constituency. These initiatives coincided with the so-called Arab Spring, where the young populations of the Arab world brought down the leaders of a number of countries. This was followed by the rise of Al-Qaeda in Iraq and then ISIS in Syria. Uh, the virulent strains of political Islam and extremist ideologies of incredible violence threatened the minds of our children. And this is where I got personally involved. Some of you may know, uh, now it's clear that you do know, um, that I was so worried about this issue that I, I wrote a book on the issue directed to young Muslims. The result of these events and movements was that we as the UAE began to take a more hands-on approach to the ideological battles taking place in our region. Bad ideas spread across borders with ease. We certainly took action when it looked like others were going to decide our fate. In many ways, we began to see that other powerful states in the region and then further afield were somewhat cavalier about what was going on and that we would need to be more proactive in our approach. We knew and we continue to, to know the neighborhood and, and the key actors. And we also understand uh, the real motivations of extremists and political Islamists. So we began to engage with these broad issues, <clears throat> excuse me, in a practical manner, in order to stop the Arab world falling into the hands of people we know harbor extremist, exclusivist, and intolerant ideologies. And we wanted to make sure that they wouldn't acquire the resources of states, whether natural or human. 
This required a lot of lobbying with Western and non-Western states, as well as coordination with friendly powers in the region. We demonstrated to big players in the region that we would not go quietly into the night. We believe that this message has been received and we look forward to a new era in our, in our relation with such states. The charm of political Islam has waned as populations begin to evaluate the costs of these experiments. The reality is dawning on many that political Islam cannot claim a monopoly on good, on good governance, if at all. Um, in fact, the opposite is true if we look at countries like Tunisia. And then of course, COVID struck. And like many countries, we in the UAE see that there are problems that need multilateral cooperation and friendship, but also a tight grasp of the boundaries of the state. We could not be asked to solve the problem of COVID in the region, but we did excel at solving it within our borders. And though we believe strongly in multilateral institutions and their importance in our global system, we also recognize that our internal systems were tested to the limit and that our economic livelihood was threatened. This caused a sea change in thinking about our foreign policy. The government swiftly moved to acquire the resources necessary to manage the COVID crisis, whether through vaccine agreements, knowledge transfer, or protective clothing. This required high levels of cooperation internally between different public and private sector units, uh, but it also required the ability to call on friends and allies. Fortunately, we were successful. We began to see that our internal needs were complex and would require greater government involvement than previously. In fact, I believe that we realized more clearly that our economy is large, complicated, resourceful, and ripe for further development. Scientific and technological preparedness has become one of the key drivers of our foreign outreach. The issues of climate change and the move to cleaner forms of energy have pushed us to reformulate what we expect of our diplomats and embassies. What then happened is a series of cabinet reshuffles that demonstrated the importance of a new set of portfolios which hadn't really received very high priority uh, or publicity in previous administrations. And those are food security and climate change, digital economy, uh, support for small and medium-sized enterprises and foreign trade. Each of these, uh, each of these uh, portfolios actually has a minister of state uh, that is very, very well connected to senior leadership. We're in the process of refor reframing our self-perception in line with what we perceive to be the next set of challenges we will face. In order to raise the UAE to its full potential, we are liberalizing, uh, liberalizing our visa regime and our commercial regulations to pull in foreign investors, as well as to provide a platform for the best talent in the world to come and participate in our offering. So how does this translate into work for our diplomats? Well, we move to, present, we, we move to presenting a fuller picture of the UAE beyond geopolitics, oil, and the fight against extremism, which were the traditional uh, kinds of topics that uh, we were associated with. And we have a focus now on attracting foreign direct investment. Our diplomats are out there every day spreading the word about the possibility that the UAE offers in terms of being a country with superb physical, financial, and legal infrastructure. Diplomats can, be expe can expect to be evaluated on the basis of their economic co contribution to the country. Instead of focusing on geopolitics, we have redirected their attention to public speaking and interaction with key audiences in the countries where they are based. In fact, as diplomats, we have begun to work closely with ministries that need to work with foreign scientific and technological partners. We are energizing our network of embassies and diplomats to reach out to trade and industry associations across the globe in order to serve the ministries of industry and advanced technologies, the ministries of uh, food security out of space and climate change, among others. Um, and, and this is sort of in reference to what the minister said. We embrace the urgent need to prepare for a post-oil era and the need to develop a strong competitive knowledge economy, which will best serve the future interests of the country and in particular of Emirati youth. The UAE's new foreign policy signals to the country's enemies, those that embrace extremist ideologies and support them, that the UAE as a sovereign state is scripting a new national narrative on its own terms. At home, national strategies have been put into place to amplify the UAE's science and technology capacities for the purposes of diversifying and growing the UAE economy promoting foreign direct investment, enhancing STEM education and improving national security. So for example, we've got the national food security strategy, the, uh, the Emirates water security strategy, uh, advanced sciences agenda, climate change plan. And I, I think you, you may have heard that we've uh, committed to a, a net zero uh, economy um, by, by 2050. Um, we have a strategy for higher education and for advanced innovation. Um, science and technology advancement as a priority pillar of the UAE's foreign policy is going to contribute to improving the UAE's partnership 
partnerships and role in international cooperation across sectors such as space exploration, healthcare innovation, and, and the climate crisis. So collaboration establishes and expands relationships, uh, something that has been a key strategic objective to the UAE foreign policy since the beginning of this crisis. The UAE government has dedicated bureaucratic and financial resources towards a future-facing agenda that bolsters the sciences, technology, industrialization, digital sphere, climate change, and food security. Uh, and um, additionally, we're focused on fixing previously strained relations with countries in the wider region by agreeing on common issues and mutual interests, enhancing cooperation in, the, in these fields and holding dialogue on contested issues. I think the most powerful example of our change foreign policy was the signing of a peace treaty with Israel. It signaled a number of key points that I believe need to be absorbed by more status quo entities and groups in the region. Number one, we are a sovereign nation and we have full agency. We decide what is in our interest and we'll act on that. Secondly, we believe in communication, not stonewalling. Refusing to speak to those we disagree with has led to suboptimal outcomes for ourselves and for much of the Arab world. We encourage others in the region to observe our example. Uh, thirdly, we are able to segregate files in our dealings with other countries. Yes, we disagree on the Palestinian issue, but yes, we can also work together in the economic and technological fields. In fact, working together allows us to understand each other better and opens the door to more fruitful discussions around areas of disagreement. Fourthly, we are pragmatic and our primary, primary duty is internal to the UAE. We will work with anyone if it helps us consolidate our progress as a nation, socially, culturally, economically, and politically. The UAE has been signaling to the region and the world that change in direction in the country's foreign policy positioning uh, has, is, is, has been afoot for some time. For example, when we hosted Pope Francis um, in, in Abu Dhabi, um, this was a remarkable move, which sent a signal that we stood very, very firmly with openness and tolerance and acceptance of other faiths. Uh, when we executed a successful Mars mission uh, organized and, and managed by um, a very young set of Emirati scientists. Uh, and when we opened the World Expo, which I'm, I'm currently taking uh, part and which I encourage you all to attend. Clearly, robust international cooperation and coordination are required to successfully enact foreign policy. And we are actively expanding our partnerships across relevant sectors and pursuing initiatives to, con to continue to improve our standing in the global community. In conclusion, I hope that I've managed to clarify how we've moved over the co course of the last decade or so uh, from a focus on the fight against extremism and the related geopolitical concerns to a foreign policy that is oriented towards deeper multilateral engagement, as well as aligning our resources with a national agenda of economic growth and increased economic complexity and resilience. And I look forward to your questions and many thanks for having given me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, I will now hand you over to Michelle, the Executive Director of the Middle East Institute, to moderate your question and answer section, uh, okay, session. Thank but thank you thank very, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. That was, uh, that was really a very interesting speech. I think as a former diplomat and uh, coming from a small state, I think we completely understand some of a lot, a great deal of what you had commented on. Um, and I also think one thing that people don't realize is that many of the plans that you've had talked about, they take a long time yeah. to formulate and to seed and to take root. You know, we, we've come to where we are because it has been a long term plan. You know? Yes. Uh, so, I mean, that's something that's very interesting. I wanted to just ask you quickly uh, before we start to take mm. in some of the questions. You had talked about science and technology. Now, this is mm. something that in Singapore is is re research and development and becoming a hub in specific sectors is something that's very important for us as well. And you've talked about science and technology many, many times. You know, yeah. you also talked about the Abraham Accords. Now, you know that Israel, in terms of technology and science, is, is far ahead of the game. And they're also a small state. You sure. know, I mean, there, there are similarities. Um, you know, how, how do you see the Abraham Accords as opening a way for for the UAE also to further its own ambition in terms of developing itself in, in, in the arena of science and technology, because you really have to have it homegrown for it to yes. really take off. You can't just import it, you know? Yeah, uh, but you know, th that's actually a, a very important question. And it's uh, something that is actually being debated. I, I've debated it with uh, some of the ministers um, who are operating in the field of uh, science and, and for example, the space program. 
Um, we know that we can't build this overnight. We know that it is a long-term strategy. Uh, is it possible to uh, seed um, an industry here? Um, that might be a possibility. One minister told me that in fact, after they'd done a survey of companies in Dubai, um, they discovered even before we'd announced any kind of space program that there were 50 companies already operating in, in the field of space, um, you know, using, using the infrastructure of the Emirates, um, but with a, with a, a global uh, kind of uh, audience. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that we're finding out about our own system, which is that we may not necessarily know exactly what is going on in our own system. And it's by reaching out to all of the foreign investors here that we begin to discover um, you know, these, these hidden gems. So the fact that you have a, a little ecosystem of 50 companies already in the field uh, kind of gives us hope that we can bring more in. So we speak to them, we listen to them, we get their ideas, and then we link those different you know, so these, these niche areas with, for example, the banking system or the financial sector, uh, you know, different legal groups. And then we link it up again with our um, diplomats and ambassadors going out to different countries that, um, to, to encourage um, uh, this kind of, uh, I wouldn't say technology transfer, no, it's, it's more of an, a, a kind of an intellectual engagement. Um, the, the other things that we have been doing is that we've been sort of setting up universities and developing centers of excellence. So for example, we have a, a, a university in Abu Dhabi, which is focused on postgraduate degrees in artificial intelligence. Uh, and yes, you know, we imported a, a huge number of uh, artificial intelligence researchers, and it's around that kind of um, seed that we hope to grow uh, more uh, uh, excellence in, in the field. Um, education, obviously, is, is the starting point, and it's a hugely contentious issue, not just in our country, but in many countries around the world. How do you go about educating your, your young? Um, and, you know, what I can say is that we've got a number of different experiments we have. Um, you know, we have the federal government, which operates public schools. We also have a very, very active private sector um, uh, that manages schools. So in fact, I think two of the largest private sector players globally in education um, are based in the Emirates. They, 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 they were seeded here, they grew here, and now they export their model of education uh, uh, to different places around the world. Um, you can't do it overnight, that's true. And, and in fact, a lot of the ideas that we're talking about today in government, where we actually feel that we're making progress, were subjects that had been discussed in the early 2000s and the late 1990s. And it's a question of how, and I discovered that it's actually quite difficult to change the, the, uh, the dynamic of government, the direction of, of the state, uh, and to watch bureaucracies fight for their old style approach. Uh, and some of the most successful um, young bureaucrats or civil servants that we have are very tough, rough, uh, and, and aggressive about changing uh, the, the, the culture. So I agree with you that it doesn't happen overnight, um, but it is, it is happening. And for us in the Arab world in particular, uh, to be able to participate in this, this experiment, what we're doing in the Emirates is really a great honor. Thank you. Actually, it was interesting that you talked about education because it also um, it is it is a it is an issue that is is a has a there's a lot of discussion about it here in Singapore as well, you know, yeah. um, and I think um, uh, it it also gives me a good start point. There are a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to have to move a little bit from the foreign policy because there are many sure. questions looking at the whole issue of religion. You know, mm -hmm. um, yes. I think your book has uh, ignited a lot of interest in this debate. So I think we've got a lot of young people online today who are asking these Wonderful. questions. So that's great. Let me just ask you this question now. Um, from your experience with young Muslims from around the world, do you feel that they are alike and that your book would resonate with Muslims from all parts of the world? What aspects of non-Arab young Muslims do you think your book could not address and why? This question has come from Nazar Fahima. Yeah. Well, one of the um, criticisms that I got was that I did not quote um, a, a single verse from the Quran. Um, and, you know, I, that was done on purpose. Uh, very often when somebody wants to present a, a particular angle on how our religion operates and what true Islam is, um, they will carefully select uh, two or three verses, maybe even more, that fill that, uh, uh, kind, of, kind of support that narrative. My position in the book was to say, actually, don't, don't take narratives from people like me. 
step, take a step back and learn how to read in the first place. Understand that when you come to a, a text as, as important as the Quran, you are coming with a set of assumptions. You are coming with a set of values that have already been instilled in you by either a violent society or one that is you know, particularly open and cosmopolitan. Um, and that's where the, 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 that's where the awareness needs to be. What is it that you are bringing to the text that then emphasizes either verses that, that call for the violence uh, or verses that call for you know, sort of peace? Um, and I was always fascinated that you know, within, within Islam, um, you could have people who claimed that it was, it was a text or the Quran was a text for absolute violence and incredible vindictiveness all in the name of, of God. But at the same time, you could have very, very uh, spiritual orientations coming out of the same uh, text, which is why I always say to people or kids who ask me, is that be aware of who you are before you try to interpret anything. Um, and that's where the, the real work needs to take place um, because we have choices in how we look at the world. Do we look at the world uh, as something that needs to be dominated or do we look at the world that, that, that in, in a sense in which we need to cooperate and want to cooperate? Uh, do I want to be king of my house and, and beat my children? Or do I want to be a father who is full of love? These are all you know, choices that we make even before we come to our religion. Um, and so, yeah, I think actually uh, a lot of kids responded positively to that because you know, we're also in a technological era where there is so much self-discovery on, online. We're provoked with so many stimuli that we begin to think, well, maybe that's what I like, maybe this is what I don't like, much more than when I was a child. And when you're faced with your own identity and then you, or rather a very complex identity, and then you, you find uh, very simplistic interpretations of religion, um, that causes conflict. And, and I think that that's the same, not just for Muslims, but for you know, Jews, for Christians, for, for a lot of different faiths. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've joked that I might actually change the change the key words and, and re, republish my book as letters to a young Christian, letters to a young Jew. Uh, just, well, you just must to... know, I, yeah, <laughs> you must know, I actually recommended your book to my nephews. Oh, yeah. To read. Thank you. I thought Thank you. it was an interesting book and, and I suggested that they read it. And I think one of them actually has, but he hasn't said much Thank about you. it. Oh, you know? yeah, no worries. <laughs> but I thought it was an interesting book because I felt that many of the ideas and the thoughts that you had was precisely what you've talked about. It is not mm. just about if you are a Muslim. I think it's it is anyone who has has a has a faith and a religion, yeah. you know. Um Okay, I'm going to go back now because there's now quite an interesting question that's come in about foreign policy. Sure. And I want to go back to that because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was something that interested me listening to you talk just now as well. It, uh, it was intriguing to hear you talk about how your foreign policy is first and foremost aimed at bettering the lives of your people in the social and other spheres. I think one thing a lot of people don't realize is that foreign policy is driven by a domestic agenda, yeah. you know. And, and so I, I found what you said sensible, but I think other people find this quite intriguing. Yeah. Uh, and so this person has gone on to ask, can you talk a little bit about how the Abraham Accord can do this? And related to this is another question. Um, what challenges did the UAE government face in communicating the Abraham Accords? How did they overcome both the religious and social sentiments? What was the cost of this pragmatic approach, mm. if any? You know, I, I'm sure it's controversial domestically, so, you know. Yeah, um, right. So there were quite a, a number of questions there. Uh, you know, the, the idea of foreign policy being driven by domestic concerns. I mean, that even applies when you look at certain countries whose foreign policy is, uh, is aggressive and um, seems to be uh, built to distract local populations or their home population from the worries of, you know, the, the, the normal day-to-day -day kind of life. Um, you know, the, the country is making great sacrifices and therefore you must tighten your belts and, and, you know, make sure that, you know, you don't complain too much. So that's, you know, domestic concerns translating into foreign policy as a distraction. Um, our foreign policy, um, well, I mean, you know, going back to the uh, 1980s and 1990s, we actually had very quiet foreign policy. It wasn't that, um, you know, we didn't have any concerns, but, you know, we were still in the, in the building phase of, of, the, of the country. 
um, uh, really understanding how the federal system works, being tested in different ways, coming together and kind of getting past those. And it was in the early, uh, the late 1990s, early 2000s that we began to feel that, listen, you know, actually the Emirates has uh, a certain amount of standing in the, in the world, a certain reputation, uh, and that we had an economic model which um, essentially is based on distribution of wealth in, in, uh, as much as possible. Um, uh, you know, either through government spending or government grants, but also um, making sure that you try to live up to the highest standards anywhere. Uh, and that attracts foreign direct investment. So, um, so that's, that, that, that's where, where we reached. Um, now you're gonna have to remind me of the other questions. Um, what were the challenges that you faced? Regarding the Abraham? domestically regarding the Abraham Accord, uh, there were a few voices that said, hey, you know, what's going on? I think there was a bit, uh, in many cases, there was um, pride that we were able to um, take a stand and say, look, this is in our interest. So there was a the pride in, in the fact that, you know, um, the, this is an assertion of sovereignty, which um, uh, hasn't, hasn't been a traditional kind of idea in, in our part of the world, I think. Um, sort of this act of sovereignty, where, uh, uh, an act of sovereignty where you're going against what looks like a taboo. Um, actually, you know, on, on, on the people to people level, there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm um, for the relationship. Um, there's, uh, you know, it, it has kind of taken the, 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 the venom out of uh, these, uh, of what I call a traditional kind of anti-Semitism, the, uh, the, the quiet uh, anti-Semitism that takes place behind closed doors. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's really no space for that anymore. Uh, and it's, um, it, you know, just walking around the expo, it's remarkable to see how many uh, clearly Orthodox Jews um, are w walking around and feeling at entirely free and safe. Um, so in a sense, it kind of reaffirms our own model to ourselves that actually, I mean, you know, we, we always said that we were, we, we always thought of ourselves as tolerant, but the true, the true litmus test of tolerance in the Arab and the Islamic world is how we uh, deal with the Jewish community. So that, that was a, a number one. Uh, the Israelis obviously uh, having ties with the Israelis is, is a little more complex. Uh, it isn't just a question of anti-Semitism, it's a question of, you know, the Palestinian issue and all of the wars that the Arabs have had with the Israelis. Um, all I can say is that, you know, if you, if you look at, I mean, with, with all due respect to the, to, to the Palestinians, if you look at the number, uh, you know, sort of objective numbers of um, people killed, Arabs killed by Arabs versus Arabs killed by Israelis, I mean, you know, the Arab world has done a far better job at doing that. Uh, and so, yeah, that just kind of puts things somewhat in, in, in context that actually we are much more brutal with each other than any outsider. And I think that's a kind of realization yeah, that, that we, need to, we need to think about how we treat each other before worrying about how others treat us. Um, and secondly, I think we, we felt very strongly that uh, our, our national interest requires us to be connected to major global hubs. And you know whether whether you like it or not, Israel is a is a is a major connector with some of the the, the world's powers. Um, the Jewish community does have a voice in many different places. They're very active, uh, and they have a, a, immense technological kind of um, uh, excellence that we believe um, is important for us. So uh, again, you know, without without saying anything uh, negative about the Palestinians, on the contrary, we think that we will be able to better serve the Palestinian cause by having direct relations with the Israelis, so. Hmm. That is a, a very practical approach. Um, I've got a question now from one of my colleagues, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Alessandro Ardino, who is Principal Research Fellow at the Institute. And he asks, Minister Shamugam rightly congratulated you on hosting the World Expo. Do you have just mentioned it as well, referring to the Jewish community? The Expo is considered the Olympics of culture and economics. What are the benefits that the UAE will gain in being the first country in the Middle East North African region to host the World Expo? Hmm. Um, firstly, it's, it's, a, it's a point of pride that you know, we, we won uh, the contest uh, um, for the Expo against you know, major, major country, major powers. Uh, so in, in terms of organization and in terms of, you know, lobbying uh, diplomatically, politically, um, we believe that, you know, we've kind of demonstrated uh, a certain amount of excellence uh, that should and can be emulated by other Arab countries in, in, in different spheres. And, you know, our, our, our deep concern is um, the rest of the Arab world. Uh, you know, 
Arabs want to move ahead, and yet there are so many different ways in which we try to move ahead and it doesn't quite work. The Emirates is an example of a country that is moving ahead from within the region with, a, with, a, um, with, with all of the problems that um, the, our climate uh, provides us, with all of the religious and, and tribal issues that many other Arab countries face, and yet we manage to organize ourselves in spite of what could have been a traditional uh, conflicted society. We've managed to organize ourselves in a way um, to attract uh, you know, a, a major event like Expo. Now the Expo itself, we've been very generous um, by funding a number of different countries. Many, many um, uh, smaller uh, countries are unable to afford their own pavilions. So we have actually funded their pavilions for them. And in one case, we've uh, even had to fund the uh, pavilion of a major superpower, in fact, the only superpower. Um, so <laughs> uh, so we, we, we've done this. And I can tell you, I'm, I'm involved in the Expo on a daily basis. And it's just such a pleasure to be able to tell the story of the Emirates. Um, just going, well, we're, we're coming up to our 50th anniversary. To think that in the late 50s, early 60s, um, our leadership was, uh, you know, in the desert. Uh, there were no roads, there were no hospitals, the, the, there was no money. Um, there was no, uh, there's no um, uh, for, kind of foreseeable prosperity. Uh, and yet when they, when, when leadership took um, uh, control of the situation, united to form the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and then, I don't know, um, it, it's, for us, it's also a, a bit of a mystery. How is it that, you know, we've managed to reach this stage um, of, of prosperity, to be honest? Um, and it's very important, again, what, what happens to the Expo after it's all over? I mean, apart from, you know, uh, showcasing the country and being able to demonstrate, you know, uh, how much fun it is uh, to be in the Emirates, um, we're also looking to develop uh, kind of the expo area into a, a tech space itself. Um, and so we're looking forward to that. It kind of signals, again, the new direction our foreign policy is taking and the focus on developing our internal economy. Mm. Thank you. Well, I mean, um, I, I enjoyed the visits that I've made to the UAE and I've been Excellent. to Dubai and to Abu Dhabi. So, you know, I've got a question that is related to what you've just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned in your previous, in this last answer that I had asked the question about mm -hmm. that Arabs want to move ahead. Yeah. But recent events such as the furore surrounding Saudi Arabia's takeover of Newcastle United yeah. seem to work yeah. against this. Now, why does this negativity over the Middle East persist? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think the, uh, the supporters of, of Newcastle are, are okay about it, I and mean, they're quite excited because they think that it'll be a, a kind of a repeat of Manchester City, um, large amounts of money going into you know building teams and, and winning games. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are always the naysayers, there are always the critics. Um, are we, I think, what, what's happening is that we're trying to really participate in a global community. We, we want to see ourselves as part of a global community, uh, which which means you know taking criticism as well. Um, it's it's uh, it's not that you know we we want to be uh, sitting out in the desert and completely uh, uh, immune to all of this, um, but taking criticism, listening to people's concerns, uh, and you know something like going in and buying a football club. Football is very close and personal to people, um, and mm -hmm. so you know it's uh, it's reasonable to see to think that you know it might be it might be a contentious issue. I think it'll be good for UK football, but. Uh, um, Arab countries wanting to move ahead. Well, I mean, I, you know, the Arab Spring was part of that. Uh, and so was the rise of political Islam. The idea that actually, you know, our problems can be organized um, by religious scholars and theologians. Uh, whereas in fact, you know, a lot of what we need is some, some basic objectivity, basic honesty, some pragmatic, straightforward approaches, not too much complexity. Uh, and, and, you know, sort of an, an attitude of getting things done. And I think, at least in the Emirates, we focus very much on uh, government uh, uh, being uh, uh, of service to the uh, population, both you know Emiratis and, and residents, rather than being an obstacle. So the idea that you know anybody within a bureaucracy is going to have power, he ha the only thing that they have is the power to serve, uh, not the power to obstruct. Uh, these are kind of uh, it's a, it's a cultural approach that has been beaten into people essentially um, over the course of you know the last fifty years. Um, leadership wants to see things done, get things done. Uh, and that means that you don't have time for corruption, you don't have time for um, you know, laziness. Okay, 
Good. That sounds that's a thank you for that. Um, let me just quickly say this administratively because I'm getting some uh, requests for questions. Can you please divert your questions via the Zoom chat to MEI events? They will actually collate the questions. Um, in the meantime, let me ask this question, which has come from one of our board members, Mr. Fazlur Rahman. Um, and he, um, he actually talks about uh, the UAE's Golden Jubilee and the hosting of the Expo 2020 in Dubai. Um, as you know, we Singapore and the UAE enjoy quite a good relationship, a very yes. good relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and our minister was recently there and he had met with uh, his UAE leaders. Um, there's also very close people to people relations. And mm -hmm. one of the things that Fazla has noted is that in the, the four pillars marking your golden jubilee, you have talked about inspiring youth to have their vision about the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, and what Fazlo has asked is, do you see some opportunities for youths in the UAE and Singapore to collaborate, such as exchange programs to promote common ideals, including mutual respect and inclusivity within our respective societies, mm -hmm. and also as global citizens? Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, go, going back already 30 years, I know that um, Singapore has always been very much a model for, for the Emirates. So we've learned and we've, we've studied and we've visited uh, a, a lot of times um, and, and, you know, have, have tried to emulate uh, Singapore in many ways. So that, thank you, Singapore. Um, when it comes to youth, I think um, it's absolutely vital that we take advantage of, uh, uh, of the possibilities. And we have a minister for youth who is, uh, I believe now she's probably 26 years old. And, um, you know, we have, we established a federal youth authority. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of support for young people to join, you know, sort of government boards, uh, business boards, um, and, and to participate in, in you know, sort of building the country. Um, I've, I've reached an age now where wherever I walk, everybody is younger than me. So I think of youth as everywhere, sort of a little unfortunate, but uh, so be it. Um, and I think also it would be great if we could begin to, I mean, we could work on a program after this uh, to connect um, young people, either either digi digitally or, uh, or, or in person. Um, there's a lot of interest in, in doing that. Um, the Ministry of Youth has like developed, they, they've developed all of these mechanisms to allow young people to make their views known uh, in an organized manner to convey that to leadership. Um, there's a great deal of interaction between the leadership and, and, and young people. So I think that's a, a really great idea. Okay, thank you. Right, uh -huh. I'm going to sort of change tack a little bit. We had a question from Arie Tepa asking, how do you evaluate the role of documents such as the Marrakesh Declaration of 2014 and the Charter of Makkah 2019, both of which ground diversity and tolerance in Islamic sources in reforming Islam and the perception of Islam across the Middle East and North Africa? Uh, you know, I mean, do documents are valuable. Um, I think for me, a personal example um, uh, has a much, much more powerful effect. Um, you know, uh, how many of us actually reads those documents with all due respect? It's, it's important that, you know, sort of senior theologians come together and can at least provide, uh, you know, theological uh, arguments. Um, but actually, it's, it's the, the personal example of leadership, particularly in the Emirates for, for us. Um, how, do, how do they treat people? What, what signals do they give? Um, and, and it's, that's where, the, for, for me, uh, personally, the, the real inspiration comes from because you know, these are strong, successful uh, men and women who have done um, you know, great things and at the same time are open. And you know, they, it's not that you know, one loses one's identity in being open and tolerant. Um, in fact, it kind of reinforces uh, that, that kind of identity. So you know, documentation is important, but uh, it's, it's actually very important to begin to see uh, people in, in, in real life interacting and modeling oneself on that interaction. Okay. Um, all right. There's a question now from um, a name I have not heard for a while, Mr. Kwa Bunwi, who actually used to be on our board. Uh, Bunwi, it's good to have you at our talk today. Um, his question is this. The UAE seems to be powering on and leaving most of its neighbors behind. Is GCC cooperation still relevant or will competition among each state intensify and there is less desire to think of an Arab solidarity. Mm. 
Uh, no, I think actually there's even more reason to think of Arab solidarity. If we actually begin to focus in on our own special strengths, um, the, you know, the, the there's not, I mean, Saudi Arabia, if you take Saudi Arabia, for example, it's got a large local uh, um, Saudi population, uh, has tremendous uh, financial resources, and it has this huge territory. And uh, to be honest, you know, it's, it's really up to them to maximize what they can do with it. Um, does it mean that, you know, th there'll be moments of competition between the Emirates and Saudi Arabia? Uh, of course, but then, you know, there's been, there've been moments of competition between, you know, Dubai Financial Center and the Financial Center in Qatar. Uh, you know, and in spite of, you know, all of the things that we think we're doing right, um, for example, if you look at the whole kind of um, crypto space, um, Bahrain uh, is, is, is far advanced in terms of regulation, in terms of registering companies and building up an ecosystem. So I, I, I think that uh, what, what happens is as we become a, a more kind of complex uh, in, in ourselves, uh, we're able to actually interact uh, with, with more pride um, and, and kind of self-confidence with um, other, other members of the Arab, uh, the Arab world. And you know, at the end of the day, in, no matter how much we may progress uh, in, in comparison with other Arab states, we still share the same ethnicity and the same language and the same religion to a large extent. And that's always going to that's always going to have an effect on. Us. So again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to demonstrate what is possible in in within the, the so-called I mean within these imaginary constraints of being Arab and Muslim and living in you know, essentially the desert. These are constraints if we allow them to be constraints. They they're not necessarily constraints if we can think beyond. So I think that's the the, the best thing that we can do as the Emirates is to demonstrate possibility. Um, uh, in, in, in a part of the world where uh, this uh, fatalism has always been you know, quite, uh, quite powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Fatima Al-Fahim has asked this question. As the UAE approaches its golden jubilee, how do you see the UAE's foreign policy in the next 50 years? Well, it's I going to be very right. different. <laughs> yeah, but... You know, we can hardly predict what happens on a year-to-year -year basis. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I, I will humbly say that in fifty years, I hope I'm promoted and I'm still around. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, patience. Huh? <laughs> I mean, I think I, one of the things I would say about foreign policy and asking someone, you know, how do you see in the next fifty years? If you ask us in Singapore, we'd tell you, listen. You know, we just need to think about what's going to happen in the next year or yeah, six exactly. months, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. how are we going to respond to that? It's In many ways, it's very reactionary. The fundamentals are set up, but yeah. you yeah. then have to respond to your environment, your yeah. immediate yeah. environment yeah. to the domestic pressure, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's really how foreign policy evolves. I, mean, I don't know if Bill Hari wants to jump in here with a comment about mm -hmm. that. Uh, absolutely. You know, when I, people ask me questions like, what's going to happen in 50 years' time? I either answer as you have, uh, Excellency, <laughs> or I just make something up. I just make something up knowing that I won't be around to answer for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, dear. <laughs> the, well, there is, there is one thing I think I, I can say, which is that um, within the Emirates, we have moved from being very, very aware of um, who is a citizen and who isn't. And in a way, you know, all of our attention was focused on we, we the citizens. And over the last few years, there's been a very, very clear um, uh, political decision to blur the lines and to speak of Emiratis and residents as the community of the Emirates. And once you take that as the community of the Emirates, your foreign policy has to change. The way in which you serve the community of the Emirates means that you need to focus on things that are outside of you know, the traditional taboos, outside of the traditional ideologies that may have driven us as a, um, you know, sort of a purely Arab Muslim society. So I think that might be one of the interesting ways in which our foreign policy will uh, evolve, but I can't say where it will evolve to. Well, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to take a pragmatic approach. I've yeah. got a question now from um, Dr. Jakob Ibrahim, who used to be uh, Singapore's minister in charge of Muslim affairs. Yes. Um, and I would like to welcome him as well to today's talk. Um, what he has asked is, against the changes that you spoke about that are happening in the Middle East, could you share your insights on the thoughts and orientation of the religious class within the Middle East? 
are there underlying tensions between this class and the ruling class? Um, underlying tensions? No, I don't think so. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, you know, within, within the ruling class, you have people who are deeply religious and people who are you know, more, more flexible about things. Um, people differ in their focus. Uh, um, how would I put it? It's a very good question. I, I think that things are moving so fast, both regionally and globally, but there are now so many things that are happening that it's very difficult to kind of you know sort of pin it, pin things down. So, yeah, probably I'm I'm not very good at answering that question. I've I've got to think about it and maybe come back to you in a few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, but, my apologies. To, no, no. To to prop Jakob, um, you know, if uh, if when His Excellency comes back to us with an answer, I'll make sure it comes to you. <laughs> 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 Some yeah. of these questions do require a bit of time to think because they're yeah. not so easily answered um, yeah, yeah. in the context of the talk. My apologies. <laughs> okay, we've got a question now from uh, uh, Mr. Saad Rahman, who's the editor of Barita Haryan and the president of Moes. What is His Excellency's perspective on economic Islam in areas such as halal, finance, etc.? Do you yeah. see these as growing prospects and uh, not causing divisiveness? Divisiveness. Divisiveness. No, I, I think actually, um, you know, uh, it, it's funny because in the region, we've traditionally had a, a kind of Western banking system. Um, and uh, I remember the late 1990s, that became, there was greater interest in, in developing Islamic financial products or products that are Islamically kind of uh, Sharia compliant. And uh, rather than causing a division, um, you know, causing a division would have been to say, no, we're not going to allow that. We're just going to, you know, have normal banking um, system and normal um, uh, kind of halal, whatever, normal products. Um, as parts of members of government did see it as a new economic opportunity. Um, and, you know, that is a reality. It is a new economic opportunity and it does serve a, a specific function. So we, we see it as a, a growth industry. And I do believe that, you know, the halal market um, certification regulation uh, and you know, the Sharia compliant financial products is uh, just another, another way in which you can package um, resources uh, and unleash economic progress. So that's definitely the case. Uh, but I will say why, what I do find very strange is given that you know, um, there, are, there are over 50 um, Muslim countries, why is it that London is the epicenter of Islamic finance? You know? It just seems, like, uh, seems a bit unfair. What, what, have, what have we been doing? Well, yes, I think that's a question that that has to be asked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, I've got a question now from one of our young researchers, uh, Dr. Clemens Che. He's a research fellow, um, and he's also one of the very rare Singaporeans who has a huge interest in the Middle East academically. He, he speaks Arabic fluently. Um, and he's very interested in the Gulf. And the question that he has asked is this, Minister, you talked about how the UAE's approach to external relations has begun to relate to public audiences elsewhere, certainly a key aspect of public diplomacy. The, US, the UAE first convened its Soft Power Council in 2017, and over the years has conceived flagship themes for each year, ranging from tolerance to innovation. What is the long-term plan for the next 50, this year's theme? And how does it build on the country's projection of soft power? Very good question. It's a question that I ask myself. Uh, I'm not sure what the uh, what the uh, program is going to be for the uh, the 50th anniversary. Um, that that is um, a kind of discussion that is above my pay grade. But I am going to be very happy to support it with my uh, all of my energy and resources. Uh, I think the, the the question of soft power. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Is, is soft power something that you can actually control, uh, manage, build, uh, or is it just a, a, an expression of very many different diverse activities taking place in your country? Uh, I, I tend to think, at least at this stage of the Emirates growth, that um, soft power is not something that we can control um, or direct in any particular direction. Um, but it is, it is a function of how we operate in the country. So, I mean, I think if you look at our Airlines, Emirates Airlines, um, started off with one plane uh, trying to trying to connect Dubai to anywhere in the world, um, and 
once that 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 then developed into a, a massive uh, operation connecting hundreds of cities to Dubai uh, and led to a certain amount of soft power. I don't think anybody thought that um, that was going to happen in the first place. But in promoting Dubai as a as a, as a place to kind of transit through or come and, and visit, um, the airline has has been a massive source of soft power. Uh, I think um, th th there are. Again, soft power, for, for me at least, it's something that we can identify after it's happened, after it's been established, rather than, you know, sort of planning in advance and saying, okay, here's where we're going to build soft power, there's going to, that's where we're going to build soft power. Uh, and that's why I think soft power is actually much more authentic um, than, you know, what a, what a, a Western consultant might provide us with. Mm, I would yeah. love to hear your opinion of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... If I look at this and, and you talk about something like soft power, I would basically say that, I mean, as you know, we have an iconic airline as well, Singapore Airlines. Yeah, sure. And Singaporeans are very proud of it because yeah. it is Singapore Airlines. It's our national carrier, you know. Yeah. Um, and it projects very far ahead because when people hear of Singapore, they tell you, you know, Singapore Airlines is one of the best airlines in the world, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, you as a Singaporean, you always feel a certain sense of pride about that. So, you know, and... Has that come, was that very deliberate at the start? It was about our identity and making our mark mm -hmm. in the yeah. early days. But it has also, I think, helped to develop that sense of pride in who we are. Yeah. Um, sure. And what sure. makes us Singaporean, you know what I mean? What are the identifiable markers? Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And Singapore Airlines is one of them. So I can understand for, for you all in the UAE as well, when, when your airlines you know, do very yeah. well. Yeah. It is a mark of, of, of your sort of identity as well. You know? Now, I've got a question from our non-resident ambassador to Kuwait, uh, His Excellency Zainal Abedin Rashid. He was a minister of state, um, and um, both Bilhari and I have served with him previously. He mm -hmm. has asked you a question. He's taking it right back now to po foreign policy and geopolitics, asking how does the UAE see the new geopolitical dynamics, in particular, the tussle between the US and China? And secondary to that, how does Iran feature? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I have a humorous response. Uh, it came up a few days ago in a discussion. I was asked, well, you know, um, the United States in the last three administration has been talking about a turn to Asia uh, and away from the Middle East. And so my response was, well, perhaps, you know, they know something we don't know, so we should also turn to Asia. Um, but it's not so simple, right? <laughs> no, not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... We, we, again, uh, it, it's in, in terms of national interest, um, wh what, are, what are the possibilities? I mean, China is a massive trade partner for us. Uh, and it's not so straightforward to say, look, we're not gonna deal with it. I mean, already um, uh, imposed, the, the sanction, sanctions imposed on Iran uh, caused huge damage to our economy, because again, we were the biggest trade partner of Iran through the ports of Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and, and Sharjah. In spite of all of the, you know, the, uh, public geopolitical problems that we we, we have with. Um, and so uh, we are very sensitive to um, the, the conflict or the, well, the Cold War between uh, the United States and China. Um, and we do try to balance uh, things out there. Um, but, you know, also very kind of objectively, we are so uh, much uh, more deeply involved with the United States than any other country, um, but um, it's difficult to see that changing in the next, you know, sort of few decades. I mean, in terms of sort of financial systems, in terms of investments, in terms of uh, computer systems, everything is so intimately in entwined with the United States. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's. Uh, I mean, if, if if our American friends have any worries, they they really shouldn't. Uh, we know also culturally where we lean. I mean, there are very few Emiratis who speak Mandarin. Uh, there are many, many Emiratis who speak American or English. So, um, well, I think American is a language in itself. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm going to go back now because there, there are a lot of questions coming in thick and fast, but there was a question that came from. Uh, Anthony Teo, who is one of the founding members of our board. He has been with the Institute since its outset, and I, I would like to ask his question uh, sure. to you. Um, he has asked, with your getting the 33 young Emiratis into high governance, how do your mathematics and, poli and politics calculations 
deal with the Machiavelli dictum that fortune is always womanlike, a lover of young men because they are less cautious, more violent, and with more audacity, command her with example. And he gives examples from the Meiji Revolution in Japan and young colonels in Egypt, Nasser yeah. and Libya Gaddafi. Yeah. Well, we're very lucky. We have no colonels, so uh, nothing to worry about there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me <laughs> let me um, let me uh, uh, ask you this question now, Yusuf Al Hamadi notes that the UAE will serve as a non-permanent member of the Security Council uh, for the period 2022 to 2023. Mm. Uh, yes. What are the UAE's priorities for its, uh, for its tenure on the Security Council? Well, priority number one will be, is, is to become a permanent member of the Security Council. <clears throat> I'm, I'm teasing, you know that, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I was, I for a minute, I thought I might have to just fall off my chair. Shock. <laughs> no, no, we are an ambitious state, uh, but no, we're not going to, we're not going to do that. Uh, what we're going to do is, well, firstly, um, you have to know that our uh, ambassador to the United Nations is a woman, and she has been uh, groomed for this position for the last six, seven years, maybe even longer, maybe even ten years. Uh, and there's a specific reason. It's because we do want to project an image. She's incredibly talented. She's incredibly hardworking. Uh, and we want to project an image of, um, you know, sort of leadership at a global level from the Arab world, uh, female. And, uh, and that, that's, that already in itself is very important to us. Uh, secondly, we want to um, really uh, kind of focus in on the concerns of small uh, states. Um, and so, for example, I, I have a lot of dealings uh, through the foreign ministry with Central America and the Caribbean, uh, and it's very important that we convey to them uh, that we are their voice also, the voice of small states that are not necessarily heard, who have specific you know, sets of issues um, that don't necessarily get to the big table. So we're going to be there for that. Uh, and I think uh, also we're going to be focused very much on women's issues and women's rights around the world uh, and the promotion of, of women's rights. So, I mean, that just like kind of... Uh, very sort of basic um, set of um, approaches that we're going to take. I think I think the the idea of speaking up for the small states is something that um, is probably needed. I think that was something mm. that uh, we did too when we when we were a non permanent member on the Security Council. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. It gives it the having these non permanent seats allows the smaller states to also have a position yeah. and have a voice and speak for others. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Tim Rotlib has asked, the UAE is one of the main importers of branch campuses of foreign universities. Mm -hmm. Would you say these campuses contribute to the UAE's foreign policy, for example, by building global connections between scholars? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, look, I was intimately involved with the establishment of New York University, um, their <clears throat> branch campus um, in Abu Dhabi. And the thinking was very specifically, there was, a, there was an issue that we were, uh, I felt that we faced as uh, uh, Emiratis, is that we would um, grow up in an Emirati system, then we would fly to Western Europe, the US, UK, we would study, we would you know, fill our minds with all kinds of exotic ideas. <clears throat> um, and then we would come back home, and all of a sudden we'd be faced with the system that we left. A system that doesn't didn't understand what we were talking about, that isn't used to policy discussions, that isn't used to broad philosophical questions, and so it, it occurred to me that one of the ways in which we can kind of uh, create more value is by um, um, establishing uh, essentially an outpost of that kind of education at home, uh, just in a purely physical manner. You you leave home, you go in, you to, to university, you your mind is is kind of provoked by all these ideas, and then you go back home and you sit with your family who have not no connection with this. So in a way, this is kind of an intellectual irritant, but at the same time, um, uh, creating uh, uh, a s s set of questions that are based in our local community. I think actually that is that is what has happened. Uh, and there are a lot of Emirati students now at, at New York University who, who have graduated and who are serving in government and in the private sector. And it's led to a change in the way in which we, we discuss matters. Um, there's more uh, connection between you know, those traditional bureaucracies and, and this kind of uh, cutting edge education. So I think that's really important. But the other, the other uh, angle that was very important was 
Um, the idea that students from surrounding countries, India, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Oman, would also come to the university. And in that sense, you would almost create a, 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 a kind of a set of people who knew each other and then who would go back and serve in their own governments or in their own private sector. So in, in essence, you know, you would be able to pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, what's going on? Um, some in, in, in ways to, yeah, I suppose, is it an old boys network, old girls network, perhaps, um, but really to diffuse um, uh, tensions if there were any. Well, these are a couple of the ideas that were in, in the back of my head and the heads of the, uh, the leadership who, who made the decision. Um, the branch campuses, it's important. A lot of people say that this is a form of Western intellectual imperialism. Um, and yet, you know, I mean, the only the only real things that we we, we pick up from that is this, is, is uh, um, asking questions, right? Why, what, how, when? Yeah. Um, and just that uh, the discipline of asking questions is very very powerful. Uh, and currently, in the Arab educational system, we haven't quite mastered that, uh, and that's why there's a demand for um, foreign universities. Mm, yeah. I think it is important. You have to be able to ask the questions and ask, learn to ask the right questions as you, yeah. you know, as you grow intellectually as well. Yeah. Um, there's a question from, I hope I pronounce his name correctly, Enoch Ang. Can Minister comment on the GCC's perspective uh, uh, and treatment of the new Afghan state, the role and the plight of women and the dilemma of education of girls in that country? I think this is probably coming on the on the tail of um, what you yeah. talked about for what the UAE would like to do when it sits on yeah. the Security Council. Well, I mean, we haven't recognized the Taliban uh, government. Uh, and actually, it's very interesting because the um, uh, there is an Afghanistan pavilion at the expo, um, but it's actually run by uh, Afghans who are based in the Emirates. Um, and uh, so they have a presence, um, but it isn't necessarily a, 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 you know, representing um, the Taliban uh, or the state. Uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've taken our time on this. Um, you know, the, the whole uh, exit from Afghanistan was quite remarkable. Uh, and, you know, obviously it sets, it sets a, a lot of questions up as to what was the point, what was the purpose, uh, and, you know, what is, what is the global community going to really do going further? I don't think we can take the lead on issues related to women's issues or, or women's education or um, other, other matters in Afghanistan. Uh, we we know uh, very clearly where we think um, uh, what what the Islamic stand is on on education uh, and and rights for women, uh, and we uh, have demonstrated that by promoting uh, women as much as possible. Um, and you know, I don't know if your your listeners know, but I mean, a third of our cabinet is female, half of our federal national council, our parliament is is, is female. There are laws stipulating that women must um, be included in, uh, you know, sort of boards of directors of companies and, and government institutions, and uh, ed education is, is guaranteed for women as well. Um, you know, it's it's very strange that we see within the Islamic world a um, male fear of female education. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense with us. It doesn't compute, um, and I, I'm not sure we would know. Uh, where to even start that kind of debate with um, uh, the Afghan leadership. But it's, mm. uh, it's a question of time. Yes, thank you. Um, I've got time now, I think, for just one last question. I want to circle back to the book that you wrote. Um, and we actually basically build on some of the things that Minister Shamugam had talked about. Um, a question came from Ong Bao Shren to ask, your book is, of course, addressed to your sons. Hypothetically, if you had a daughter, would you focus on different topics and avoid some? Right, well, hypothetically has now turned into reality. I actually have two daughters. Uh, they are twins who are three and a half years old, and I can hear them. <laughs> so I, I wrote them. <laughs> My book came out in 2017, so, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I think, actually, uh, uh, my book to my daughters would be uh, firmer. Um, more insistent on um, self-respect uh, and dignity and autonomy uh, and, the, and the freedom to think um, as broadly and as clearly as possible about what, what their options are in life and what they want. Uh, yeah, I feel very, very strongly about um, making sure that um, my, my daughters, um, you know, are allowed to uh, uh, blossom uh, and live up to their potential. 
I, I think you know one of the, I mean not not just with with girls, but I mean I think it's a real tragedy that uh, so many children don't even begin to scrape uh, their real potential. Uh, and I think you know I, traditionally I hear that Singapore has been very good at you know, sort of um, developing a, a young people's atten um, potential. Um, we in the Arab world, I mean, we're in mixed we're in a mixed kind of we have, we have a mixed approach. We really want to find the, the, the greatest genius in the world amongst our children, but at the same time, we do everything possible to make sure that they never read a book. I, you know, so this kind of contradiction, desire, but also fear of what comes out of the, the mouths of, of uh, educated young, young people. So it's a story to be told. I think so too. Thank you for that. Um, this has really been a wonderful session. Um, Chairman, I don't know if would you like to close up to thank? No, I just want to say that this has been one of our best SR Northern lectures, and I'm not saying it just out of politeness, because as Minister Shamogam said, I'm not generally known to be very polite, but I say it sincerely. Thank you very much. And I thank, thank you very you. much for uh, joining us and sharing uh, with us, uh, giving us so much food for thought that I think um, we will all go back with and ponder what you have told us. Thank you again, and I hope to be able to meet you in person you know, before too long. Well, uh, thank, thank you also, uh, all of you, uh, Michelle, Bilhari, and uh, Minister Shamogan. Uh, it really has been an honor and a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Uh, I hope I wasn't too vague. Uh, I know at times I got stumped. Uh, forgive me for that, I'm, I'm nearly human. Uh, and I really look forward to coming and checking the books in your libraries. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, both thank Excellency you. and right, Minister thank Shan thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you Minister Shamugam. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank all right. you all very much for joining us today. It has been a really enjoyable talk, um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Middle East Institute event. Thank you, everyone. Thank bye, -bye. You. bye bye. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you.